Hello and welcome to Social Cybersecurity, Social Influence and Design in End User Cybersecurity. If you're joining us live, our speaker is in the Slido chat discussion answering your questions right now. For audio video issues, click the technical support button below. I'd now like to turn it over to Shavik Das for the presentation. Thank you for that introduction, Casey. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Shavik. I am faculty at the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech, and I'm excited to speak to you all about my research on social cybersecurity today. So before we get into the details, uh, just a little bit about myself. I joined the faculty at Georgia Tech in about two and a half years ago now. Wow. Um, I got my PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 2017. And at Georgia Tech, I direct the SPUD Lab, which stands for Security, Privacy, Usability, and Design. And the work we do is sort of at this intersection of HCI, cybersecurity, and data science, which I hope will help contextualize the sort of things that you're going to hear about today. So I'd, again, like to remind everybody that I am currently in the Slido chat. So please do ask me questions if you haven't. So I'd like to start my talk today with this question. Of how can we design systems that encourage better cybersecurity behaviors? And I think this is an important question because of how foundational security is to computing. Our email, our money, our creative work, all the photos we take with our friends and loved ones are all ultimately protected or not by the cybersecurity decisions we decide to make on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so it's no uh, surprise that the cybercrime industry has sort of evolved to exploit end-user cybersecurity behaviors in that way. Uh, one McAfee estimate puts uh, the global annual damages at approximately 600 billion US dollars every year, with as many as two thirds of all internet users having personal data stolen in some capacity. And the Kaspersky estimate suggests that as many as 323,000 new malware files are being produced every single day. But the kicker is that pretty much all of this industry would be hamstrung if end users ended up uh, using sort of expert recommended security and privacy advice, like keeping their software up to date, using two factor on important accounts, or using a password manager and regularly updating their passwords, right? But when we think about end user security and privacy behaviors, we're confronted with more sobering statistics, right? Like uh, one uh, estimate from a Google software engineer in his Usenix Enigma talk. Uh, in 2018 suggested that fewer than 10% of Google consumers enable two-factor authentication. Similarly, the Pew Research Center suggests that only about 12% of US internet users use password managers, and approximately only 22% of users use uh, smartphone users lock their screens and keep their phones completely up to date. And Android, um, in, a, in their own estimation, suggests uh, as of May 2019, suggests that only 2.3% of their users use the latest ma uh, minor version uh, of the Android operating system. Um, so we don't really think uh, in the end user context of those expert recommended security behaviors as much as we think about people you know, sharing passwords with their friends and loved ones or ignoring software updates because they're inconvenient or falling for scams that seem like they should be obvious or propping open electronically locked doors with garbage cans. And I say this not to cast uh, blame or shame on these users, in fact, I've actually probably done each one of these things at some point in my life. Rather, I think all of these end users' uh, behaviors and decisions sort of make sense in the context in which they sit, but it does speak to this disconnect between how experts want people to use secure systems and how end users actually use those systems. And so we need to do better as a community. So in 2014, I wanted to figure out a little bit more about this, right? I interviewed people and I asked people, what makes them use a pin on their phone or enable two-factor authentication or keep their software up to date? So I want to read you a few quotes from that interview. I started using a pin because everyone around me had a pin, so I kind of felt a group pressure to also use a pin. One of my boys wanted to use my phone, so I gave them my passcode. And not that I care for, uh, have anything that I don't care for them to see or anything, but after they did that, I then changed it. My friends have a lot of different accounts, the same as me, but they didn't get into any trouble. So I think maybe it will not be dangerous to reuse passwords. Now, did anybody notice a trend? Right, it's all social. Well, okay. Um, and it turns out that security behaviors, like any human behaviors, is primarily driven by social influence. So more broadly, 
In the interview study that we conducted, approximately 50% of all of the end user security and privacy behaviors uh, that were reported to us seem to be driven by some sort of social trigger. For example, observing somebody else or having a conversation with a friend. And that might seem like a lot, but it shouldn't be that surprising. Social psychologists have for decades provided empirical evidence that human beings are largely social creatures and that much of our behavior can be explained by the social influences that we face every day. And yet we rarely consider the social dimension in the design of our security systems. And I'm here to argue that absent knowledge of how social influences affect security behaviors and vice versa, we have little hope of doing much better. So today, I want to share with you two projects that I did in collaboration with Facebook to shed some light on how social influences affect cybersecurity behaviors. And by the end of it all, I hope to have convinced you of the following. Social influences drive cybersecurity behaviors, and we can encourage better cybersecurity behaviors by making cybersecurity more social. So let's start with that first project that I mentioned, measuring social influence in cybersecurity. So of course, the first step in making cybersecurity more social is to understand how social influences affect cybersecurity behaviors in the first place. And I was fortunate enough to partner with Facebook in analyzing this. Specifically, we analyzed how the use and non-use of three optional security tools was affected by friends' use of those same tools for about 1.5 million social uh, uh, Facebook uh, user social networks. So the three tools that we studied were login notifications, which just sends users notifications about suspicious logins, login approvals, which is Facebook's version of two-factor authentication. And if those first two security tools seem a little bit more sort of the standard offering that you would expect a company like Facebook to provide, the second one is, or the third one, trusted contacts, is a little bit more social, right? So with trusted contacts, you specify three to five of your friends uh, who can vouch for your identity if you ever lose access to your account. So we collected 750,000 data from 750,000 users who newly adopted one of these security tools, as well as data from 750,000 counterbalancing so-called use nots who had never adopted one of these security tools. And then my research question really boiled down to this idea of, can we distinguish between which of our users was a security user and which was a security use not based on the presence of social influence in their network? And to do this, I used a technique called math propensity sampling analysis. I'm not going to get into all of the details of this today, but at a high level, uh, there are these sort of two steps you want to keep in mind. Now, the first step is that for each security tool, you want to empirically select exposure levels to friends who use that particular security tool. For example, for login notifications, you might pick 1%, 5%, or 10%. And what these exposure levels let us do is they let us split our user base into two sets, one, uh, one set of users who are exposed at that level and one set of users who are not, so the exposed and the unexposed. So exposed users have at least 5% of their friends who use login notifications. And unexposed users do not have at least 5% of their friends who use login notifications. Then, for each of these exposure levels, you can compare the adoption rate of those two groups, the exposed and the unexposed. So do people, are people who are exposed at the 5% level more likely or less likely to adopt login notifications themselves? And of course, there's a bunch of other hidden tricks going on in the background using propensity sampling in order to make sure that the comparison is more fair. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of that in the presentation, but I am, again, in the Slido. So feel free to ask questions there, and hopefully I can answer your questions. But the broad idea here is that difference between the adoption rate of the uh, exposed versus the unexposed group of people is sort of our proxy effect for social influence. And the way you can think of that working is that if we have um, this chart, which is uh, the affirm the hold on. OK, I think you can see it now. So if we have this chart uh, where the x-axis is the aforementioned exposure levels um, that I mentioned before, you know, 1%, 5%, or what have you, and the y-axis is the aforementioned proxy measure for social influence that, we're, that we were talking about, the exposed minus the unexposed adoption rate, if social influence had absolutely no effect, you'd see this flat line at 0, because that suggests that there's no difference in the adoption rate between those who do have a certain amount of friends who use that tool and those who do not. More likely, however, you're likely to see um, sort of this uh, line that goes up and to the right. And this is what we call the expected effect, the hypothesized effect, because there's a ton of work in the social psychology literature that suggests that the more likely your friend, the more of your friends who do something, 
the more likely you are to do that same thing. And so we might expect to see something uh, like this up into the right curve over here. But what do we actually see? So if we plot the results for trusted contacts, we see something that looks a lot like the expected effect. Social influence has a positive effect even at low levels of exposure, and that effect becomes increasingly positive as you're exposed to more and more of your friends who use trusted contacts. And that's great. That's some of the first empirical evidence that we have that social influence affects cybersecurity and privacy behaviors. But when we start to uh, plot the results for login approvals and login notifications, we see something a little bit more nuanced. Uh, specifically, what we see is that in the bottom half of this graph over here, hold on, where you see this uh, green area that I've highlighted, that's where social influence has a negative effect on cybersecurity and privacy behaviors. So what's going on over there, right? That seems incredibly counterintuitive. Why would social info, why would, why would it be that the more of your friends who use a particular tool, the less likely you are to use that tool yourself? So in talking to my friends in marketing and in uh, social psychology, it turns out that there might be a, an effect that explains this, and it's called disaffiliation. And disaffiliation occurs when uh, an uncool user group starts using your product. So for example, when teenagers start, uh, teenagers stopped using Facebook when parents started using Facebook, right? Because all of a sudden it stopped being a cool platform. Now, the early adopters of security and privacy tools tend to be perceived by non-experts as people who might be a little bit overzealous, a little bit paranoid, or a little bit nutty. And in turn, this paranoia and nuttiness might stigmatize the use of the security tools. Because if the only people you see using two-factor authentication are people who you feel are a little bit paranoid, you're unlikely to use two-factor authentication yourself because maybe it's only for paranoid people and you're not a paranoid person. However, there are two pieces of good news here. The first is that all of these effects go up and to the right. And that means that more exposure is good. Um, the more of your friends who use a particular security tool, the more positive the effect of social influence. It's just that for standard security tools like two-factor authentication and login notifications, the effect remains negative until very high levels of exposure. But the second piece of good news is that the design of a security tool appears to affect its potential for social spread. So trusted contacts is a more social tool, and it never experiences the stigmatic effect that I, that I uh, observed with the other two uh, cybersecurity and privacy tools. And when speaking with the people who design trusted contacts, as well as the people who use trusted contacts, it really came down to these three dimensions of observability, cooperation, and stewardship. Observability captures this idea that people can see when you use it. When you specify your three friends who are your trusted contacts, they get a little notification that makes them feel good and alerts them to the fact that this is a tool that they can use too. Cooperation captures this idea that people like to work together towards something, right? So with trusted contacts, your friends are working together to provide, uh, to provide greater security for you. Whereas with uh, traditional cybersecurity tools, everybody's sort of cloistered in their own little digital bubble and doing what they can for themselves and only for themselves. And then finally, stewardship captures this idea that people like to uh, act on their concern for other people. So in this case, with trusted contacts, your friends are acting in your benefit. Whereas with traditional cybersecurity and privacy tools, there's no such concept of acting on behalf of somebody else. So social influence drives security behaviors and design affects the potential for social spread. But what, what can we do with this knowledge to actually improve cybersecurity and privacy behaviors more broadly? So it's really hard to make, to retrofit uh, cooperation and stewardship into existing cybersecurity and privacy tools, but you can definitely make them more observable. And that's the hypothesis that I wanted to test with, the, with, with my next uh, study. So essentially what I did was I ran a randomized uh, between subjects experiment with, with 50,000 Facebook users. And the experiment was rather simple. Um, I essentially piggybacked on Facebook's annual security awareness campaign, which shows people on the top of their newsfeed a little notification that alerts them to the fact that extra security settings exist. Now, before I came in and joined the team, Facebook was gonna use this very vanilla notification that just alerted people to the presence of extra cybersecurity uh, tools, right? There was nothing special about it, um, just, a, just a simple notification. When I joined the team, I decided, can we test social proof cues? Now, I tested a variety of different social proof cues. I'm not gonna go into each and every one of them, but you can see sort of the spread on the slide over here. Uh, the raw number condition just showed people the exact number of their friends who use extra security tools and uh, as a way to incentivize them to click. 
and then all the way down to the sum of your friends, which was very vague and just informed people that, you know, there were other people in their friend group who, who also uh, used uh, these tools and that they should check out um, the tools as well. So essentially we had eight conditions, the seven, seven social variations that I very briefly spoke about in the previous slide, as well as one non-social control. And we assigned uh, randomly 6,250 participants um, to each of these conditions. So the 50,000 participants I talked about before. And we ran the experiment for about three days such that any any of our uh, participant users who were who logged into Facebook in those three days saw um, the notification um, that uh, they were assigned to um, at the top of their newsfeed. So to measure the effectiveness of these, um, you know, security and privacy announcements, uh, we we ca we calculated these three different measures. Um, the first was click through rate which essentially captures how many people clicked on that button, you know, the improve account security button. The second is the seven day adoptions. And the third was the five month adoptions, which is um, how many people actually adopted one of the promoted security tools, which were the same three that I did in the previous study, uh, seven days after exposure and then five months after exposure. So this is what those numbers look like at a broad level, um, aggregated across all conditions. So 93% of participants logged in and saw the announcement 13% clicked on announcement, 4% adopted one of the promoted tools within seven days, and about 10% adopted one of the promoted tools uh, over five months. And here's what those numbers look like aggregated, uh, split across the different conditions. And there are two key takeaways I want you to take from this. The first is that every single social condition outperformed the control condition in terms of soliciting more clicks. So in fact, we had a 36% we had a 36% improvement in a click-through rate if you compare the best performing social condition, which was raw number versus control. And the second thing I want you to take away is that the best two performing conditions, the raw number and the sum conditions, actually solicited 10% more five-month adoptions as well, which is a pretty remarkable result when you consider the fact that I only changed a couple of words at the beginning of a small little notification in an otherwise busy interface. If you've ever done A-B tests before, you might have some experience with how much uh, the, the effect size of a change in copy, right? And it's typically not anywhere near this. Maybe it might be 2% or 3% if you're lucky. So we can encourage better cybersecurity behaviors by making security more social. Now, remember that I started this talk with this question. How can we design systems that encourage better cybersecurity behaviors? My research suggests that there is a fruitful but untapped opportunity to make to improve cybersecurity behaviors by making social systems that are more observable, cooperative, and stewarded. By observable, I mean answering this question, how can we make it easier for people to observe and emulate good cybersecurity behaviors? Now, to use a crude physical world analog, if a samurai or a ninja came bursting into your window and there were a bunch of other people around you, you would be able to immediately see the threat and you'd be able to see what everybody else does to protect themselves against that threat. So some people might run away, some people might hide, other people might be foolhardy and run into the and run into their doom. And you can sort of observe and react uh, as you find appropriate. Maybe you decide, okay, I should also run because that seems to be the strategy uh, to to keep my life. Um, now contrast this with cybersecurity, right? Uh, we're kind of in a fog of war all the time. We can't really see the threats that are coming towards us. We can't see what anybody else is doing uh, to protect themselves against those threats. So it's really unsurprising then that end users often get blindsided uh, by cybersecurity threats and often don't know what to do about them. When I talk about cooperation, I really mean answering this question of how can we design cooperative systems that make group security a joint effort, a sum function or a max function instead of a min function. Now to use another crude world, uh, physical world analog here, consider the, situ consider the contrasting situations of walking alone with a friend at night versus walking with a uh, walking alone down a dark alleyway at night versus walking with a friend down a dark alleyway at night. You feel more secure when you're with a friend, and that's because you know implicitly that an, an attacker would have to overcome the two of you to get to uh, anything that they might want, right? Now, in cybersecurity, consider the situation where I, as somebody with good cybersecurity behaviors, am sharing sensitive material with a friend who has weaker cybersecurity behaviors. I've effectively declassified my information because the easiest way to get to that information now is by compromising my friend. And this creates a you know, perverse uh, disincentive uh, so that experts are not really incentivized to act with their uh, non-expert friends. 
And non-experts have fewer opportunities to learn from their expert friends and fewer opportunities to benefit from uh, being with an expert friend and sort of joining in um, uh, sort of their security behaviors. And then finally, by stewardship, I mean uh, answering this question of how can we design systems that allow people to act on their concern for the security and privacy of their loved ones? My preliminary research suggests that a lot of people um, are more concerned about the security and privacy of their friends and loved ones than they are about themselves, right? So of course, you know, my dad needs to use a password manager. Oh, but I don't need to because I can memorize really strong passwords, you know, like, uh, it, it, but, but he definitely should. But existing security and privacy tools really give us no outlet to act on our concern for others. Again, we're sort of cloistered into our own digital bu bubbles and anything we do is really only for our own benefit. So how can we change that? Okay, so of course, as a part of this presentation, as a part of this conference, we're all encouraged to create an apply slide to give you some uh, examples of what you can do with this information, right? And my apply slide here is to, make, to take small steps towards making security more social. The first thing I recommend you do is to share your knowledge. Have a regular public, public conversation about your pro cybersecurity behaviors and why they are important to you. You're not gonna get a lot of clout from this, but having that signal there might just implicitly inform the people that you're connected with that cybersecurity is an important thing that they may need to consider every once in a while. Be a safe ambassador. Make a dedicated safe space or time for friends, family, and colleagues to ask for help and advice. Oftentimes, experts do not really want to burden their non-expert friends with cybersecurity advice and behaviors because they think that they don't want to hear it. And that might be true. But if you make a dedicated uh, safe space and time, it might be less burdensome for your friends and family members to come and ask you for, uh, for your help. And then finally, advocate for pro-social design in your, uh, in your institution, right? So consider how you can integrate things like just-in-time social proofs and observability and cooperation and stewardship uh, to encourage pro-security behaviors in your product and organization. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk and I would like to just remind everybody that even if you don't agree with any of the specific recommendations that I, uh, that I laid out, I hope to have at least convinced you of the following. Social influences strongly affect cybersecurity behaviors, and we can encourage better cybersecurity behaviors by designing more social cybersecurity systems. If as a community, we can keep that simple point in mind, I think we stand a fighting chance of designing systems that encourage better cybersecurity behaviors. With that said, Remember, I am on the slide here, so I am happy to answer any other questions you might have.